Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> you just can't help but smile whenever I, I can't help but smile whenever I say it or whenever somebody says it to me. So let's do that one more time. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Right on. Right on. I am here to welcome you, to welcome you into this precious new year, to say thank you for that profound sacred service that we had last Sunday as we, as we came together, aligned our chakra energy, and renewed that power within us that allowed us to truly let go of anything and everything that we were ready to let go of before we came and stepped into this brand new year. So thank you for that as well. So I'm going to go with the uh, introducing our theme for 2018. And this is our Centers for Spiritual Living theme of igniting transformation through spiritual living. We are truly focusing on that this year. And throughout all of the world, all of the Centers for Spiritual Living are, are introducing and un unveiling the banners. Well, since we don't have our own space, it's kind of difficult to have banners. So, well, I do it by slide. So imagine this was our banners and I'm unveiling it. This is what our banners look like for this year. A hundred years of science of mind, uh, igniting transformation through spiritual living through a hundred years of science of mind. So everybody take that in for a moment. As you know, our center is celebrating its 10th year anniversary this whole year. We started in August when it was our 10th year anniversary, and we're going to culminate that next August. But just take that in. Science of mind, 100 years. You know, it's in some way we can think, well, that doesn't seem like very long time. You know, 100 years is kind of a drop in the bucket when we look at eons and eons of, of wisdom throughout the years. But 100 years of this thing known as Science of Mind, the textbook and the philosophy written by Dr. Ernest Holmes, which was a compilation of new thought, which we know is really old thought. It's that deep inner wisdom that truly is the principles that follow throughout the eons of years. And so that is our theme for the um, year and for the month. So it would be, I think, proper to start out with an Ernest Holmes quote that's gonna lay the foundation for the rest of the service this morning. And this is written by our spiritual leader, Ken Gordon. The science of mind is the operating manual to life. It's like we're given the most marvelous computer in the world, one whose capacity is infinite. Most of us were taught by our teachers and parents to use it as a calculator, or at best, a word processor. Without an operating manual, we use it for what we think it can do and what we've proven for ourselves that it can do. The science of mind opens avenues and programs we haven't even thought about. It, if used according to the manual, it has the capacity to broaden our lives infinitely, restructure our health, our wealth, our creative expression, and loving relationships. I would agree with that. I'd also agree that there's a lot of other philosophies out there that kind of do the same thing. So I don't think that, in my opinion, it's end all be all with the science of mind philosophy, but I do know that it is a beautiful way of life and a teaching that teaches us how to think, not what to think. And to me, that's refreshing. If I know how to think, then I get to use my own unique creative skill and my own unique rooted in groundness to the truth of what I know is my being, and then I get to apply it. And so to me, that, that lifts me up. It empowers me. It allows me to step into a place of pure potentiality, and I like that. So Ernest Holmes says, the science of mind is comparatively new, but the mental experience of the invisible universe is as old as the history of humankind. It is new and that it's the first time in history we have put together all findings which contribute to the establishment of humankind's relationship with the universe to the end that we may be able to apply our spiritual understanding to the everyday, and this is his quote, to the everyday problems of human life. Now, we can think of it as problems and they certainly show up sometimes and feel like problems, but we all I believe everyone in this room, because I know pretty much everybody in this room, I know that we have evolved into an awareness of consciousness where we know it's life. You know, life isn't just made up of problems. Life isn't just made up of 
uh, this cattle prod way of moving from one icky situation, praying and hoping that the next situation is not going to be icky. We know it's life. And so the, the culmination and the purpose of the message today is to truly step into this awareness at the highest degree that is possible for us individually right now. Because remember, this philosophy teaches us how to think, not what to think. So the decision is entirely ours as to the degree we want to step into this awareness and experience life through the awareness and attributes and the beliefs and the perspectives that we choose to put on there. And so we're going to dive into that this morning. And based on that, let's go to the next slide. Y'all know that I like to start out with a little bit of something funny here. And I love this slide. I think I've shared it with you before, but here we go. <laughs> I love this slide. <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times people are consider, consider hot flashes to be quite a bother. Yet we are intricately creative beings. And when we are at a level of conscious awareness that knows that the universe supports us in every way, then I'd say here was a great example of where hot flashes were used in a great way. Wouldn't you? So next time, anybody that experiences those in a snowy climate, next time you're having a hot flash, give this a try. I think it might work for you. And we'll certainly make shuffling those steps a lot easier. So there's an example. We know we can go through life complaining about these things that we may very well not have any control over. Now, we know that we can manipulate certain conditions like how much we exercise or what we eat or balance our hormones and all that. But to some degree, hot flashes may or may not be in our control. To the extent that they aren't in our control, what else can we do about them? We can look at them and see what is the gift here? What's the blessing here? I guarantee you there is one because I have not yet found anything in my life that has not ultimately shown me that it is a blessing and a gift. And generally, the struggle and the strife and the, and the cause to despair and hurt and pain is what I needed to go through to get to that awareness. So I also don't begrudge any of that as well. So let's go to the next slide, please. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you just hear him in that voice? In my day, I had one toy, and it was a stick. And I was happy to have that stick. Darn happy to have that stick. And in a way, that is so true, because that's really what we're showing in this teaching, that there isn't any way we can get away from evolution, folks. We are constantly evolving in our conscious awareness of the truth of our being. And at some point, we did only have a stick as a toy. And we were happy to have that stick. And life was good because it was seen as pretty basic and, and uncomplicated, I guess you could say. Um, back in that day, maybe it was complicated by different things. Like we had to work hard to grow the food that we ate. There wasn't a, a multi-level grocery store at every quarter where we could go get food. But for whatever reason, we evolve through life. And as life is evolving, our choices, I believe, gain. We get greater choices. We get more choices. They multiply. Have you all found that in your life? Your choices multiply, especially when you hit adulthood, right? Because when we were kids, you know, our choices were fairly limited to a certain degree. But then when we become adults, oh my gosh, we have almost like unlimited choices. We get to choose what we want to do every single moment. We can stay up all night if we want. We can party. We can watch movies. We can do whatever we want. But we know that there's something that comes with that too, right? There's this thing, you know, results, circumstances. We create those based on our choices. Remember, the decision is ultimately ours each and every time. And so as we go through life, and we evolve consciously, consciously, and we become even more aware of the power that we have to consciously co-create our life based on what we put our awareness on, where does that place the ultimate responsibility of how we feel? I love Ross in the back. He's like, oh, uh, 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 uh. like right here. Ultimate really responsibility is right here. 
So I love that slide. So I think there's, there's one more, and it's going to take me to this great thing that I can't wait to share you. So let's go to the next slide. French fries. Y'all didn't know that the key to life was French fries, did you? Yes, okay, some of you did. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I'm showing you this picture because a, a dear friend of mine, she's a, she's a beloved, powerful minister in our organization that goes into schools in all of the Dallas school districts, and she teaches meditation and, uh, to, the, to the kids. And they really, they've gotten rid of all of their, um, what do you call that thing where you send kids? Detention. They've gotten all, rid of all their detentions because they now do meditation. It's a regular daily practice in all of the age groups. And I just love her because she's living her dream, she's following her passion, she's touching lives, and she's making a difference. She posted this picture of French fries the other day, and I'm sharing it with you because it kind of matches my, my talk. And her name's Veronica, so this is what she said. I was driving to the post office, and suddenly I had a craving for French fries. It's been a while trying to think of good fries in Dallas and where I can get them, but I really wanted Hyde Park Grills fries in Austin. So I got out of my car and I found this. I laughed so hard, nearly knocked myself over. Not exactly how I wanted them to show up. I guess I must fine tune my intuitive skills. <laughs> So folks, doesn't it seem like that sometimes? I mean, we know we got the power, right? Who's got the power? I got the power. But doesn't it seem like that sometimes? Literally, driving to the post office, she starts thinking of french fries. She gets out of her car, there's french fries. Now, I doubt she picked them up, ate them. I doubt it. I don't know. I doubt she did. But it reminds me of our levels of conscious awareness and how we evolve. It's, it's also parallel to... Um, Joseph Campbell's levels of awareness and the hero's journey. You see, this is kind of how it, I'm going to do a really quick summary of that. So this is Joseph Campbell and New Thought's levels of awareness. First level, that we live a life based on survival, sex, and power. The first level, according to New Thought, that we live our lives with the consciousness of being a victim and everything is done to us. How many of you guys can relate? That at one time or another, at some time in our lives, unless you all came in as, you know, at the, operating and vibrating at the higher level, there's been times where we can feel like everything's happening to us, where we kind of feel like the victim. But we know that there's something greater. We know that we evolve to a different level of understanding, and I know each and every person in this room um, has, everybody that I know, anyway. So the second level of awareness is openness and willing to move more into a God-filled place, that things are done by me, that this is where a lot of folks like to hang out at this level of awareness. You know, some folks can hang out here multiple lifetimes because they're just, that's just really what they're into. You know, they, they know they got the power, they know they can consciously um, focus on what it is that they want to create, french fries, and some don't mind that they show up on the pavement. They just know that they've created it, and that's cool with them. Generally, that's the parking, good parking place people, you know, the people that, that like to manifest those things just like that. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's a great way to live. Just know that there are higher levels of conscious awareness. Next higher level of conscious awareness is that are things that are things, things are done as me, and the fourth level are that things are done through me so that we experience that oneness with the divine, we experience that oneness with God, and that we live, move, and have our being breathing that same essence and surrendering our individual will, surrendering our individual need for control or need to, you know, whatever. You know what I'm talking about, that worry, that control, that anxiety, all of that where we surrender to that and we step fully into the divinity and the truth of our being and we operate from that state. So it's those levels that I mean and when I mention that, that I'm talking about. And so when we say, let's go to slide number six, please. Or whatever the next, I think it's whatever. So, here we go. Dear beloved friend of mine, Temple, Happy New Year is more than a day. It carries within it the decision and possibility for us to ask ourselves, 
what happiness truly means. One day won't change our happiness, yet the decision to be so will lead us to a happy new year. It goes back to what I was talking about. Where's the power? It's that decision. The decision is ultimately on us. And when we enter into this milestone, I mean, granted, is there really any different between December 31st and January 1? How much of a difference is there? The sun rises, the sun sets. Yeah, a little hangover. Okay, for some, a little hangover, says Lynn. But te technically, you know, there's not that much of a difference. So if we were to look at these milestones, there's something that I think comes with it and that gift and that blessing that comes with knowing it's a milestone. So I'm gonna, gonna use Jan Desay's blog, a little bit of what she wrote in it to describe what I mean. So just go with, go with me here at what she wrote. The ball descends, the wild bells ring out, and the minute hand moves to 12. This is the moment when we choose to celebrate the renewal, rebirth, and rejuvenation. In this moment, we are hopeful, we reflect, we have resolve. And then, for many of us, the moment fades along with the hope and the resolve for lasting change. Like you, with the strokes of midnight, as another year slipped away, the limitless potential of a new beginning rose before me. Yet, as I recognized that potential, I also knew that I had a choice. I could choose to let that limitless potential fade, to let this moment slip by, or I could choose to strengthen my resolve to embrace myself with love. How beautiful is that? So the decision is ultimately ours, right? We've already established that. We've laid the foundation for that. But how do you think it comes about? How do we do that? How do we hang on to that? How do we keep that awareness front, mind, and center at all times? She goes on to say, all changes feel difficult to most, especially positive ones, because it means that we have to give up some of that dark stuff that gives us false comfort. Without that false comfort, we have to start committing to building real, long-term comfort. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There's the short-term comfort and the long-term comfort. Can you put that slide up for me? Did I put it in there about the uh, floors? Floors. It's a meme about the floors. Here's a good one about short-term comfort and long-term comfort. I can tell you the number if you want. You need it, okay. Um, seven, it should be the next one. There we go. Life is full of choices. Remove your shoes or scrub the floor. The choice is yours. There's an example of short-term comfort and long-term comfort. As you know, back to those decisions that we make. So without the false comfort, we have to start committing to building real long-term comfort. And that's where it can get scary. I can do this now, but how the heck am I going to do this next week, next month, or for an entire year? How, how many of you have been there? How many know what I'm talking about? Yep, yep, yep. So rather than getting lost in an overwhelming future, let's instead focus on the moment only. Positive change in the long haul is the ultimate goal but you can only get there with a series of daily steps. I realized that all I had to do was make a commitment to love myself today. And with the precious gift of one more day on this earth, I choose to be an awakened custodian of all that I am consciously calling in. Makes sense. So I really resonated with what she had to write about that happy new year idea. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to then Go back to that question of, so then, that's great. So what's the best way to do that? There's tricks, there's trades. Everybody's got something up their sleeve. What's working for you, what's not working for you. I think that's another reason why we get together in fellowship, so that we can experience that and share it and talk about it, feel it, project it with one another, reflect it with one another, be the gift, be the blessing. So I'm gonna share something that I think is a good example of that by Elizabeth Gilbert. Y'all remember Eat, Pray, Love, which was her debut as a, a really famous author, and then she's written many um, bestsellers since then. So this is what Elizabeth Gilbert wrote that I think good, depicts this. Her and her beloved partner, Rhea, were going through something, were experiencing something that they felt a lot of energy around, and she said, Around 11 p.m., I found myself in this state, 
huddled on the couch in the fetal position, clutching pillows, eyes wide, speechless, and paralyzed with fear. That's never good, right? I've been there before, and that is never good. At that moment, I closed my eyes and asked myself to observe what was going on in my physical body, my animal body. What I felt was a sickened stomach, shaking hands, a clenched chest, shallow breathing, a wild and uncontrolled mind, and an elevated heart rate. This is exactly what happens to an animal when it's being hunted. At that moment, I asked myself, is this a helpful response, Liz? And my answer back to myself was, nope. So if I believe that I am here to serve the world, and I do believe that I am here to serve the world, then how does it help anyone if I'm feeling and acting like a hunted animal? The answer, it doesn't help. Feeling hunted and trapped doesn't serve me, and it doesn't serve anyone. So this is where Raya and I made the decision to turn off every single electric device in the house and get real. We stepped away from the television, away from social media, from the phones, because we knew that right now, we needed to find calm. That these are the moments when it's time to find out who you really are and who you really can be. We lit a candle, sat with each other in quiet prayer for a while, and then we each asked the big question. Who do I want to be in this situation? This is a question that we ask in our house a lot these days. This is a question Rhea has taught me over the years to ask myself always when stuff, and let me just say, I put the word stuff in here. She said a different word. So when the, st <laughs> when the stuff goes down or when the world goes crazy or when the panic starts to rise, who do I want to be in this situation? This is the question that Rhea and I asked ourselves. Now, this was written in November of 20. 16. So when she says six months ago, it was six months prior to that in 2016. So this is the question that Ray and I asked of ourselves six months ago when the doctors found signs of tumors on Raya's pancreas and liver and it didn't look good. I remember the day she went in for her CT scan to confirm just how bad the situation really was. We woke up that day in panic. We were both experiencing the standard human response to scary situations. We were undone. And we both felt like we are terrified and anxious and we will be terrified and anxious until we find out the results of the CT scan. We will not be at peace until we know what's going on. And if the results are horrible, we will totally fall apart. But then we stopped and checked ourselves and asked, really? Really? Was that true? Was it true that we could not be at peace right now? Even if we didn't know the outcome or even if the outcome promised to be horrible? So we got really quiet that day. We went in, did our prayer work, and asked, what do I want to be in this situation? And the answers came. Calm, strong, open-hearted, curious, generous, wise, brave, humorous, patient. Once we answered that question, we found our peace because that part was up to us. Who we would decide to be, regardless of the outcome. And once we found our center again, we were able to walk into that hospital with relaxed breathing, clear eyes, steady hands, and a resolute heart. We were able to find peace before we even knew the results. And a few days later, the results came. Cancer, not just any cancer, but terminal cancer. But by that time, we were at peace. We were ready because we knew who we were. And once again, facing that difficult situation, the only question on the table became, who do I want to be in this situation? That is the only question that ever really matters. I insist that we can l learn with practice how to choose our emotional state in all situations because our state of being is literally the only thing in the world that we can control. This is not denial, it's not complacency. This is not me cheerfully saying, oh, well, I'm sure everything will be fine. Sometimes things aren't fine. Sometimes the diagnosis is terminal. Sometimes the dark forces win. Sometimes the outcome feels dreadful. But all of our practices in peace and gratitude and courage are for times like these, for times when you do not get the outcome that you think you want. It's the time when things matter, when the stuff goes down, when the stuff goes wrong, when the stuff gets real, and that's when the stuff really gets interesting. 
That's when the tests come. Who will you be right now? Right now. Right in this moment. Because it's the only part that's up to you. So back to my talk title and my message for this morning. The decision is yours. The decision is mine. That's our ultimate power. That's our ultimate awareness. And no matter where we are on that consciousness evolution that I talked about, where I talked about Joseph Campbell and the New Thought steps, no matter where we are, the decision is still ultimately ours. Who do we want to be in this situation? Who do we want to be in this moment? Who do we want to be? And then you can fill in the blanks. So they said, Liz goes back to saying, we decided then in that moment to step away from the burning, global, burning vehicle of global panic. We decided that when the world is trampling itself in a stampede of fear and anger, we will not join in the stampede. In the same way that we decided six months ago to find peace in our hearts before we got the biopsy results, we decided last night to find peace in our hearts before we got other results. So we decide who we want to be. And it such makes a difference, doesn't it? I bet each one of you could think of a, an example to share with each other of just this past week where either you showed up in a way that grabbed your attention and caused you to pause and be like, whoa, or you were in a situation where you noticed someone else behaved and operated in such a high level of conscious awareness that it grabbed your attention and you were like, oh, yeah. How many of you have had an experience like that this past week? Yes. And how many of you were a part of that experience just this past week? That's what I think Liz was talking about. That's what we're talking about here all the time, every Sunday in classes and community events and community outreach through the foster care program and through all of the different things that we do. We're just really here to show up and be love, here to operate at the highest level of conscious awareness that we can embody in that moment based on our intelligence and wisdom that has been married to that infinite intelligence and wisdom that we know we're connected to. So who do we want to be? There's a great story that went out that I saw actually this morning, and I noticed that Maureen posted it, but I actually saw it from a different site that is a great example of what I'm talking about. Did you guys, have you guys heard of the story, the true story of the woman, uh, she wrote it that she was sitting on a plane, and I believe that plane trip was to, uh, it was either Philadelphia or Pittsburgh but I want to share the story with you. She says, as I sit on the plane, I talk with an autistic little girl who has braces on both of her legs. Yet she kept saying hello to me and telling her mom that I was her Spanish teacher, Mrs. Cindy, from somewhere near here in Detroit. She introduced me several times to her bear that was named Kindness. I couldn't help but notice how kind the mother was to her daughter. She redirected her several times, kept telling her to hold her voice down, and she held her hand on the takeoff and the landing. And once we reached the gate, the mother quickly grabbed all their things and tried to get her to the front. However, they only got a few rows forward and everyone could hear the mother say, hold on to kindness, hold on to kindness. And that would help the girl hug the bear. So naturally, my tender heart wanted to cry out to everyone on the plane, did you hear what she said? Hold on to kindness? I thought, how appropriate. There may have been some annoyed by the little girl talking during the whole flight, or some may have been shy when the little girl wanted to hug them or give them a high five. Even the gate operator named Rebecca in State College, Pennsylvania, got a hug and then a small kiss on her arm from this little girl. Yet the joy this little girl made me think of, yet, yet the joy that this, of this little girl made me think of our world and how we all just need to hold on to kindness. So I talked to the mom coming up the ramp of the plane and told her what a great job she was doing with her daughter. She made several remarks and I told her I knew it had to be tiring, but I thanked her for being so consistent. And then she told me that the little girl was gonna have surgery on her legs to correct them. But then she told me that she, the mom, was battling brain cancer and how exhausting her treatments are. And my heart sank. And I assured her that she would be in my continual thoughts and prayers and how she and her daughter taught everyone a lesson today to hold on to kindness. 
because you never, ever know what somebody is going through. Well, folks, I have been in this profession for many years, and prior to that, I was a hospice chaplain for many years. I can promise you that, that everybody's always going through something. <laughs> it's just, it's life. And that word and that definition that we put on the word something, it's life. And I'm not really sure, I mean, I do know that that level of conscious awareness that we work through and that there's, there's times when, when what we're going through can seem uh, unfair and it can feel really difficult and we can start feeling like a victim because of it. Yet, who's got the ultimate decision of how to feel about it? That was a question. <laughs> who, who has that ultimate decision? We do, right? We do, B, 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 yes, B. And it's okay. I mean, I, I have to tell you, do you know how many times people have asked me in the last two weeks, how was your holiday? Did you have a good holiday? Tell us about all the fun things you did on your holiday. <laughs> I can't tell you how hard of a question that has been to answer. Yet, I think it's so important for us to be real and to be authentic and to answer that question of who do I want to be in this moment? I wanna be real, I wanna be authentic. I also want to step into that pure potentiality power that I know we all have in what we focus on and what we're aware of is what I create in my experience. So I know that the natural grieving process is okay and that it's important for us to hold each other kindly and gently while we're going through it. I also know that it is not a permission slip to feel like a victim, that it's not a permission slip to, I don't know, do any of the, the normal human uh, ways of conditioning to try to deal with it, go hide, or I don't know, I mean, you guys come up with some, <laughs> and I'm drawing a blank right now. But what I do know is my choice, my desire is to not use it for that. But to use it for what I know each and every step of life is there for me for. And that is to consistently and constantly bring me to that place of greater conscious awareness. To that place of greater sacredness. To that place of profound knowing. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's go to, it's my slide 11, please. I don't know what number it is for you. Here it is. The quality of your life will be determined by the quality of your attention. It's kind of another way to ask the question of who do I want to be in this moment? Who do I want to be in this situation? What is the quality of my attention in this moment? What is the quality of your attention? And that will reflect the quality of your life. And it is a beautiful thing, folks. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I am so grateful. So grateful. So our roomieism today is slide 14. Remember, the entrance door to the sanctuary is inside you. The quality of your awareness, that moment where Liz so beautifully described how she was completely falling apart. She couldn't control the thoughts in her mind. Her body felt like a hunted animal. But there's something that kicked in right then, right? She remembered. She remembered that the entrance door to the sanctuary was inside her. So as soon as she moved her level of awareness within and did what she knew she needed to do to center in prayer, then remember those qualities? Remember the answer to that question of how do you want to be in this situation? It was calm, peaceful, courageous, powerful, loving, generous, kind. Think of the bear. Hold on to kindness. Hold on to kindness. So we're going to close with our affirmation, the last slide here, folks. And then before I do that, I will read this last quote from Ernest Holmes. I've shared it before, and it's a quote that I absolutely love because it feels very empowering. And depending on how well I can hold it together, I'll tell you why. 
I shall keep the promise that I have made to myself. I shall never again tell myself that I am poor, sick, weak, nor unhappy. I shall not lie to myself anymore, but shall daily speak the truth to my inner soul, telling it that it is wonderful and marvelous, that it is the one with the great cause of all life, truth, power, and action. I shall whisper these things into my soul until it breaks forth into songs of joy with the realization of limitless possibilities. I shall assure my soul. The reason why I'm crying is because my grandmother was the one person on this planet that treated me like that always. The one person that I ever experienced complete and total unconditional love, who had never shared a single judgment, a single unkindness, who loved me completely and believed in me completely. Now with her passing, does that mean that I've lost that forever? No, that's why I shared this quote. My God, she's given me a great gift. She's saying, it's yours to do now. It's mine to do now. So the decision is yours, folks. The decision is mine. Let's read the uh, affirmation here on the screen. The quality of my life is determined by the quality of my attention. And so it is.